Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History, Part 23. Um, it's my birthday today, and I thought it would be appropriate to celebrate it with you guys by talking about Aristotle. So, I've entitled this talk, The Good Enemy of the Perfect. So let's dive in. All human beings according to nature, desire to know. And it's with this little sententia, Pantes anthropoi tu eidenai oregontai fuse, that the greatest student of Plato, known widely to us as Aristotle, uh, so optimistically opened his magnum opus, the metaphysics. Ta meta ta fusica, literally, the things after the natural things. Though perhaps our good philosopher was being a tad overly optimistic in this assumption, um, I can think of plenty of people who don't give two shits about knowing anything, uh, what I think it does is at least tells us something about our old chap Aristotle himself. Aristotle, whose name in Greek is pronounced Aristoteles, dates to around the years 384 to 322 BC. He was, of course, a giant among the Greek natural philosophers, and if we're forced to make the distinction, we'd also call him the first scientist. So, uh, born in the city of Stagira, which is in northern Greece or central Macedonia, uh, his father, Nicomachus, was a, a personal physician of the Macedonian king, so although there isn't really much verifiable information on Aristotle's childhood, he likely spent his days in the Macedonian palace winning over patronage from Macedonian monarchy. Aristotle's father passed away when he was just a young child, uh, but at the age of 17 he joined Plato's academy in Athens and would remain there till the age of 37. Not long after Plato's death, Aristotle left Athens and then was hired by Philip II of Macedon to tutor his son Alexander the Great, and this was starting in 343 BC. During that time, Aristotle taught not only Alexander, but two other future kings as well, Ptolemy Soter and Cassander, uh, the first Antipatrid dynast. So, Aristotle actually encouraged Alexander to fight against the East, and his attitudes against the Persians were uh, shamelessly xenophobic. It's as if he'd already forgotten that the long lineage of ideas that he'd inherited had come directly from the East through his predecessors Plato, Socrates, Pythagoras, and the Ionian physicists. Now, in true pagan fashion, let's not retro-project any Judeo-Christian morals on this man, Aristotle counseled Alexander to rule with an iron fist and be, quote, a leader to the Greeks and a despot to the barbarians, to look after the former as friends and relatives, and to deal with the latter as beasts or plants. <laughs> well, we all know what Aristotle did to beasts and plants. Now, this may seem very harsh to us, but at least it was honest. Only saints operate differently, and it typically winds up killing them. Uh, and so, as a matter of fact, near the end of his life, Aristotle became even estranged from Alexander on account of his relationship with Persia and the Persians, and his uh, quote-unquote race-mixing projects and, and that kind of thing. In any case, by about... 335 BC, Aristotle had come back to Athens to establish his own school, which would be known as the Lyceum. Uh, if you grew up in a French education system, you'll likely recognize this as the root of le lycée. Uh, there he ran courses at the school for the next 12 years or so, and this is probably when he wrote most of his material. There. Aristotle got married, he was widowed, he then remarried, and he had a kid. And according to the Suda, which is a much later work of Byzantine lexicography, uh, he also had a young beloved. Um, 
an eromenos, to use the word, which was the standard pedagogical thing at the time. Um, the Greeks loved their institutionalized pederasty, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Now, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, and I quote, Aristotle was the first genuine scientist in history, and every scientist is in his debt, end quote. Now, I find this statement to be somewhat dismissive of everyone who came before Aristotle, such as the Ionian physicists, and it's Eurocentric to boot, uh, but we really can't downplay the importance of Aristotle to world history. Uh, Newton was correct to say that he'd only seen so far in as much as he'd stood on the shoulders of giants. Well, the same must be said of Aristotle. He didn't come up with all of his work ex nihilo. Now, not only is our old friend the Encyclopedia Britannica's darling boy genius in regards to science, but he was also so important to both medieval European and Arabic thought that everyone just called him the philosopher. The philosopher. Aristotle was uh, also revered as the first teacher among medieval Arab intellectuals, and although his contribution to the natural sciences were significant, Aristotle's impact was felt chiefly in the domains of Judeo-Christian and Islamic cosmology and metaphysics, especially when it comes to the scholastic traditions of the Catholic Church. Throughout his lifetime, Aristotle wrote so many books, uh, it's estimated he wrote 150, that we're probably safe to assume that he actually read literally everything there was available to read in Greek. I'm actually quite relieved that this sort of feat would be impossible to accomplish today. Uh, I've heard it said by one fairly serious scholar, tongue-in-cheek of course, uh, that if there was ever a sure sign that extraterrestrials intervened in the history of man, it was Aristotle. Now, unfortunately for us, only about 30 books of Aristotle survive, so we've lost well over two-thirds of his material. Not only that, but what does survive aren't these sort of great refined works of literary and poetic genius like Plato's. They're more like sketchy lecture notes than anything, as far as we can tell. In this way, things aren't painstakingly laid out for us. We've often got to provide our own examples, flesh everything out ourselves, if, if we want to make any sense of Aristotle. You, you've got to work slowly and carefully, because there's plenty of filling in the blanks to do. Now that being said, we can rest assured in the fact that even the great Cicero, uh, a man who really knew a thing or two about style, he even said that Aristotle's literary style was like, quote, a river of gold, a flumen aureum. So we know what we're missing was good shit. Well, okay, moving on. We talked in previous lectures on Plato about his magnum opus, the Timaeus. Uh, in there, Plato, the disciple of Socrates, described in vivid detail how the world was carefully and harmoniously designed by a godlike craftsman who was guided in his design by reason and order. Now, if this was true, some sort of investigation into the natural world should reveal this to us. And in this way, to Plato, studying the natural world was sort of a, a means to an end, rather than an end in and of itself. I'm almost certain he got this view from Pythagoras. Uh, the reason you should spend time studying the natural world was because it was self-transformative. Uh, in exploring the beauty and the order and reason of the natural world, one could awaken the beauty, order, and reason within oneself, uh, so knowledge and contemplation of a rational universe produces rational individuals, and these individuals then are the ideal constituents for a utopian state. So Plato's science, or natural philosophy as it was called in his day, 
at, at least until the scientific revolution, uh, was teleological. It, it had a purpose. It was to create wise, enlightened, and just individuals who would then take part of a wise, enlightened, and just society. Well, when it comes to talking about Aristotle, most people tend to emphasize the differences he had from his master. But in my opinion, I think there were a lot more things which brought Plato and Aristotle together than pulled them apart. Now, of course, throughout his life, Plato had no interest in some of the things Aristotle became most famous for, namely physics, geology, and biology. But when we take a step back and, and we look at the full corpus of each of these men, uh, when we look at the types of questions they were asking, they were mostly concerned with the same issues. With grammar, logic, rhetoric, poetics, ethics, aesthetics, music, politics, geometry, astronomy, metaphysics, and so forth. So, not surprisingly, these are the things which are of interest to us in this lecture series. What made Aristotle so important for so many people and for so long, what made him THE philosopher, is that his work was so comprehensive and so seemingly consistent that it provided a cohesive world system, a whole picture of the universe, a cosmology, if you will, and, and this would be embraced by the world's brightest minds for centuries to come. All of Aristotle's various writings are consistent with one another, they click into one another very reliably, like the pieces of a giant intellectual jigsaw puzzle. Uh, this internal consistency dazzled the world, and, and for a good reason. This was the first fully unified system that later natural philosophers could work with. Now. All this being said, it's safe to say that Aristotle had no delusions here. Uh, he would not have claimed that he was writing some complete picture of the natural world by any means. What we can say about Aristotle for sure is this. He knew he was leaving behind a methodology for continuing the project he'd begun. He left us with a systematic way of approaching any subject whether it be concerned with zoology or linguistics. So, I want to talk a little bit about Aristotle vis-a-vis -vis our friends, the pre-Socratics, and then I'll mention a few things about Aristotle in regard to his master Plato. There's really so much to talk about on the subject that it's, it's uh, hard to stay organized, but I'll do my best. Aristotle called the so-called pre-Socratic philosophers the physikoi, as in those who study nature, physis. This is the basis of our modern word physicist, but obviously this modern version has too limited of a meaning to express what folks like Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, and so forth were all about. Now. For the most part, Aristotle thought that these brilliant men were on the right track insofar as they studied nature. But he also thought that they were misguided in their methodology. They weren't systematic enough in their approach. It was Socrates, then, who set the standard for uncovering the truth about things. He set the method, but was too concerned with all manner of ethereal idealisms to apply this method to practical matters. The study of politics, of virtue, and metaphysics made up the bulk of Socrates's, and by extension Plato's, inquiries. So then Aristotle's project was to take this methodology as laid out by Socrates and apply it to questions which were more to the tastes of the physikoi, the naturalists. In short, let's get back to nature, but with a better and more consistent approach. It was the material world that mattered most, pardon the pun. Uh, you know, the study of elements, of, of organisms, of animals, of human body. 
these were the kinds of things which turned Aristotle on. He didn't really believe in a realm of forms. He wanted to lead people away from their focus on reality as this perfect, transcendent, and unattainable thing. Instead, he wanted everyone to consider the truth, with a capital T, or reality, to be both imminent and imminent. So let me stress this. Despite all the years in Plato's academy, Aristotle never thought of the world around him as a cave of illusions. He never incorporated the idea of the forms into his epistemology or ontology, that is, into his way of knowing he knew things and into his way of knowing he existed. To Aristotle, the realm of forms was all around us. It was nature itself. A world is form, not word. I'll come back to this in a second and, and how this view may have positively influenced Plato himself. Now, hopefully all of this brings to mind that very famous fresco from the Vatican painted by Raphael, the School of Athens. We've got a big crowd of philosophers from throughout the ages. Uh, Pythagoras is chilling with Averroes and Empedocles. Uh, a clothed Diogenes is strewn about on the stairs all by himself, as one does at these sorts of occasions. <clears throat> Zarathustra and Ptolemy are playing some basketball. Uh, Socrates, Xenophon, and Alcibiades are all hanging out in the back. And of course, right in the middle of it all, we've got Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right. What I semi-facetiously call wisdom and understanding, respectively. If you look at their hands, you can see the gist of their entire philosophies in a single gesture. While Plato's hand is pointed toward the heavens, toward the realm of ideas, not literal heaven, uh, Aristotle's hand stretches out forward toward the earth, toward the realm of manifestation, rather than the world of abstract ideals. In their other hands, they each have a book. Uh, Plato has the Timaeus, and Aristotle has the Nicomachean Ethics. Just as a side note here, uh, if you're ever looking at this painting and wondering why Plato looks so familiar, well, it's because he was painted by Raphael to look exactly like Leonardo da Vinci, who was himself a prominent Renaissance Neoplatonist. And not only that, but Raphael uh, painted himself in, too. You can see his little head popping out behind a pillar between Pythagoras and Epicurus on the left. Uh, Heraclitus our good old weeping philosopher, is also really just Michelangelo, and Euclid is the architect Donato Bramante. People loved doing this sort of stuff in the Renaissance. And an even more scandalous and wide-reaching superimposition of a contemporary face upon an ancient sage occurred when the Renaissance Pope Alexander VI, one of the Borgias, commissioned a number of paintings of Jesus for the church. Well, you know who was used as a model for this rebranded Arian Jesus? His own son, Cardinal Caesare Borgia. So yeah, uh, one of the nastiest members of one of the nastiest families in history is actually the first face that pops into mind when most people hear the word Jesus. Just something to think about. All right, so, how then did Aristotle fit into this picture with all these great figures, especially in regards to the so-called pre-Socratics? Well, if we look back to some of our previous lectures, can we remember what the main questions that these guys like Thales, Heraclitus, and Parmenides were asking? Well, they were chiefly concerned with two big questions. Uh, what is the world made of, and what is the nature of change? Let's begin with the first question. What, what is the stuff of the universe? If it's all made of one thing, as uh, any good mystical experience would tell us, then what's it all made of? So, if you remember, for Heraclitus, the world was reducible to fire and void, which I suppose is not terribly off, uh, 
because our world is in fact made up entirely of energy in space. If we look to Thales of Miletus, we see that the universe was conceived of as being entirely made up of water. Well, this wasn't really a terrible guess either when we consider how vital water is to all forms of biological life, and that we all know now that every species on this planet began our journey in primordial waters. Uh, others like Anaximenes put air as the first principle, since it's vital to our existence as well. Uh, throughout the Indo-European tradition, life and breath have long been correlated. Uh, anima in Latin, which is the root of the word animal, actually means breath or spirit. Uh, the word spiritus has this dual function as well. In Homeric Greek, psyche or psyche doubles as breath and soul. Um, and then if we move over to India, we've got this idea of prana as life force, which is why among the eight limbs of yoga, pranayama, or breath control, is so central to the whole practice of union with the one. All right, so further still, other men posited earth was at the source of it all, and of course, this isn't a bad guess either, because we are, in fact, all made of carbon and minerals and so forth. Well, all right. We've got all these competing prima materias, to say nothing of, of forms or numbers or whatever. The problem with all these competing views is that they never sat down and tried to get along. Everyone was too busy trying to affirm what they'd already deduced to be the most foundational substance, and nobody really ever came to a synthesis. Well, enter Aristotle. So I should mention that, contrary to popular assumption, Aristotle was a monist. He, too, believed that all things were ultimately derived from one thing, but it wasn't going to be void, it wasn't going to be fire, it wasn't going to be air, or earth, or water, or number, or any of those things. Well then, what was it? Well, to Aristotle, it was just some sort of universal stuff, devoid of any qualities whatsoever. This stuff, he called hule, or matter in Greek, you may recognize this as the root of the word hiletic, which is one of the two or three Gnostic personality types, along with the psychics and the pneumatics, uh, the mental people and the spiritual people. Later, the Latin-speaking Aristotelians and alchemists would call this stuff prima materia, or prime matter. But to Aristotle himself, this was just stuff, hule. He wasn't really interested in what the universe was made of. And he makes that clear in an example he gives. Imagine a house. Okay, now, what is this house actually made of? Well, it's made of stones and mortar and hatch and straw, let's say. So, all right, we know that. Well, what if we point out to you a, a big old pile of raw materials? Some stones, some mortar, some thatch, and some straw. Is that a house? Well, no, it isn't. And not only that, but a house can really be made of all sorts of different other materials. Uh, bricks, glass, shingles, aluminum, and so forth. So what's important to Aristotle, and this is most likely on account of his time spent under Plato, is the actual way that all of these constituent materials are put together. It's the configuration of the matter that determines what it does. What the house is made of is irrelevant if the design is good. The whole is more than the sum of its parts, Aristotle always used to say. So now, if we were to distill this down into a little sentence, we could say that Aristotle believed that things began to exist once matter, hule, was imprinted with form, morphe. Prima materia, then, is like a lump of wet clay which is shaped into a vessel of some sort, or a tile, or a tool, or whatever. To Aristotle, this hule and this morphos could not exist independently of one another, and it's for this reason that we call Aristotle's whole position on this issue hylomorphism, from hule and morphos. <laughs> 
So that settles the question of what stuff is made of, at least until Paracelsus shows up. So then, what about the question of change? Well, to Aristotle, change occurred, but it only occurred on the level of form. Matter didn't change. It was just the form that changed. If we take our hypothetical clay vessel we've made and we smash it, well, obviously the matter hasn't changed. It's still clay. It's merely lost that human imprint. It's lost its form. Aristotle's world was one of change and constancy, of novelty and habit, as Terence McKenna would eventually put it. Anyone who thought the world didn't change, <coughs> Parmenides, well, it's because they were too fixated on the habit or constancy of the universe. And they put their blinders up in regards to change and novelty. And then obviously the inverse was true. For those who saw the world as nothing but change, I'm, I'm looking at you, Heraclitus, well, that's because he was too busy noticing everything changing whilst ignoring most other things that have a general inertia or resistance to change about them. You may have heard me say this famous line, the only constant is change. Well, that's from Aristotle's own mouth, so he gave us a great little aphorism to sum up his feelings about the whole issue of change and constancy. The only actually constant, immutable, and enduring thing is change. So that settles that, and quite decisively, I might add. Uh, the Buddha would not disagree. Now, Aristotle defined change much in the way that the later Hermeticists would envision it, and that's chiefly because Hermeticism was, on the one hand, deeply influenced by, and on the other hand, deeply infected with, medieval Western Aristotelian thought. Change, he thought, occurred along a continuum of opposites. Black-white, cold-hot, pain-pleasure, slavery-freedom, darkness-light, and so on and so forth. What Aristotle perceived, then, was changes in state between potentiality and actuality. So, for example, cold is not in and of itself a thing, it is the lack of a specific thing, which is heat. And therefore, cold is just heat in potentiality. And heat is just heat in actuality. Let me repeat that, because it's important, and, and I'll do it with a different category, too. Darkness is not in and of itself a thing as perhaps the Zoroastrians of Aristotle's time would have argued. No. In fact, darkness is merely the absence of light. And therefore, darkness is just light in potentiality. And light is light in actuality. We've got all these polarities at work, and the universe is the sum total of this interplay between potentialities and actualities. Now, we've talked about all this in regards to our classical hermetic axioms, so I hope this is nothing new conceptually. I just want you all to realize who was the first guy to put it into words, as far as we know. Now, of course, there's a strange problem here. Obviously, not every one thing is potentially every other thing. I can't start to boil cold water, uh, water which is potentially hot, and then expect it to turn into light, or virtue, or courage, or whatever. These are categories. The example used by Aristotle is of a cow eating grass. Um, now, once the grass hits the cow's stomachs, that prima materia, which makes up the grass, is dissolved and converted into milk. Um, this reminds me of a Louis C.K. skit you might know. Anyhow, what this implies is that grass is potentially milk, because if a cow ate gravel, it wouldn't convert it into milk, because gravel was never potentially milk to begin with. 
So yeah, this I think is how Aristotle deals with this problem while still being a monist. Although it's very clear that there's more than one category at work in this game of potentiality and actuality, all these categories, heat, light, virtue, etc., are reconciled with one another within the very polarity of potentiality and actuality. I think it's for this reason that in the Aristotelian view of the cosmos, there's no beginning and no end. There's just an infinite process and oscillation between potential universes and actual universes that go on and on ad infinitum, ad absurdum, ad nauseum. And I would say that the Hindus had reached this conclusion much sooner than the Greeks had even begun thinking about these sorts of things. Whether they wrote it down is another matter. All right. Well, next up on the chopping block, we've got Aristotle's epistemology, his theory of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How do we know that we know that we know? And so on and so forth. Uh, for Aristotle, true knowledge was causal knowledge. It's knowing the cause of things, which is actually the Latin slogan for my alma mater, rerum cognoscere causas, knowing the cause of things. It wasn't this gobbledygook sorcery about remembering some distant realm of forms or tapping into some collective Jungian unconscious or anything like that. Knowledge was simply a matter of understanding the way a thing is the way it is. This sort of knowledge Aristotle called episteme, and it's obviously the root for our word epistemology. The reason I'm telling you this is because Aristotle distinguished in his works between the causal knowledge, this episteme, and what he called techne, which is a sort of artisanal knowledge. Um, it's, it's practical smarts, the kind tradesmen have instead of biologists or analytical philosophers. So, being on the topic of natural philosophy, I want to take a second to discuss this word, nature. It comes from the Latin word natura, which in turn is based on the passive principle of the deponent verb nascor, nasci, natus sum, which is to be born, begotten, generated, formed, or whatever. And no, it has nothing to do with the Egyptian god Neter, for you green language folks. If you want an equivalent that's an Egyptian for this word, albeit not an etymologically related one, I think Kefir would do. Now, the word Aristotle uses for nature is physis, which in turn comes from the Greek word phuo, which means the exact same thing as nascor, to be born, begotten, generated, etc. So when you hear all these natural philosophers yammering on for the next 2,000 years about nature, that's what they mean. Uh, that which is, that which has come into being. It's the same thing for the word physics, uh, which we can just render natural things. I tend to think that we in the modern world have a very skewed understanding of, of what is natural, and this skewed view actually started with Aristotle. Now, whether or not something is natural should have nothing to do with whether something is man-made or not. We're not divorced from nature. We're, we're, we're in it, we're made of it, and thus so are the chemicals we ingest, the plastics we dump in the ocean, the hadron colliders we build, and the spaceships we send to the moon. Which, by the way, happened, and if you don't think so, you've been duped by a Saturday Night Fox special of all things. Anyhow, it was Aristotle who led the charge on the dichotomy between natural and artificial things. Now, I'll be fair to him and explain how this dichotomy came about. According to Aristotle's definition, natural objects are objects which are endowed with their own inherent propensity toward motion or change. And it's this propensity, then, that drives these objects on toward their final cause. What I might call, with this dirty little word, its purpose. 
as we can see, there's some teleology at work here in the mix. So take a mustard seed, for example. It falls on a trodden path and nothing happens. Elsewhere, it falls on receptive soil and blossoms into a great plant. Uh, this seed, we might think, must have had a natural propensity toward becoming a plant, because as we say in good Aristotelian fashion, that the end goal was, quote, in its nature. All right then, so well, what about artificial things? Well, to Aristotle, these were things which lacked this inherent propensity toward its own ends. Though a tool like a hammer or a saw could serve a purpose, these things are in and of themselves inert. They've got a lack of internal agency of change, if you will. Artificial objects like plastics, hadron colliders, spaceships, and so forth, these all require external agency, agency from natural things to get them in motion. Now, I'm not so sure I can say the same thing about man-made chemicals. Um, I wonder what Aristotle would have thought of nanotechnology and synthetic compounds, but we'll never know. Well, all right. How is this different from the way most of us see things? Well, you see, modern science obviously rejects final causes for any and everything. Why is this? Well, it's because the modern worldview is one devoid of purpose or direction. Uh, obviously, we can see individual or groups as constructs of self-reflecting images ascribing purpose to things. But this is an entirely subjective process. If this upsets you, uh, well then I think something's wrong because this is actually incredibly liberating information, whether you tread the path of the cloth or whether you're a banker. Uh, this whole purposeless universe was uh, something that Terence McKenna wrestled with intensely for over a decade, and I don't blame him. But. Uh, in a battle of wits with the mushroom and some MAOIs in 1994 at his home in Hawaii, he had an existential breakdown of sorts and it really rocked his career. Uh, he wasn't sure if he should go on speaking and peddling the hope of a hidden purpose to the universe, so he tried to reinvent himself and move in a different direction with his work. This uh, pissed off a lot of the eat, pray, love types over at Esalen and in other New Age circles. Uh, a lot of them felt betrayed, but, you know, people change. Perspectives change. The only constant is change. You can't be upset over the fact that someone doesn't acknowledge an inherent purpose or meaning, because that is a choice in and of itself that someone's made and decided to abide by. And even then, okay, let's let's play a game. Uh, what if this whole 2012 transcendental object at the end of time thing is real, and we're all on our way up and out through higher levels of order or consciousness or whatever? Well, where is it taking us? It's got to be either toward more of something else or to nowhere. And so what... Would it matter to a single-celled organism if he knew that in billions of years he'll be human? He's a single-celled organism in the here and now, and he's got to deal with that reality as it comes to him, frame by frame. Anyhow, I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but I'm just trying to mention this because teleology is a very sticky and difficult topic, and a large part of our drive towards teleological thinking came to us from that great churning of Aristotelian and Catholic thought in the medieval universities. It will come up again, and again, and again. I don't want to totally disregard it or write it off, but what I want to say is that a teleological perspective is just that, a perspective, one of an infinite number. You can choose to live a purpose-driven life, or you can choose to consider the lilies of the field who do not toil and yet are clothed in raiment far greater than anything Solomon had ever worn. Don't 
be a tyrant for purpose if that so happens to be the perspective you possess because you're going to run into a whole lot of pain and suffering trying to convince all of those around you who don't share that view. I'm not opposed to the possibility that the future might draw upon the past like an attractor, but as far as things appear, without making any leaps of faith, we must assume time in manifestation is linear time, albeit not simultaneously apprehended. Teleology is embedded in the virtual fabric of our language, even when we're talking about science, so don't feel too bad if you stumble into it every now and again. There's something about it that rustles up our common sense. Why does a bird have a wing? Well, so it can fly. Well, how can the later state influence the earlier state without positing all this jazz about a transcendental attractor at the end of time. Another way to put it is this, uh, and this is a great example given by the John Hopkins University chemist and historian whose lectures I use to help me make this series, and that's Lawrence Prinkopi. He says, let's say a chemical system tends toward the lowest energy state. Well, how does it know where it's going? Again, how can the later state influence the earlier state? Well, frankly, it's just a manner of speech. This problem arises in the way we talk. If we wanted to talk purely Apollonian and discuss the mathematics and the statistics, we could demonstrate how any sense of causation just disappears in the numbers. If I'm not mistaken, uh, before Terence's great change of heart, he'd been faced with what was called the Watkins Objection, uh, a serious rebuttal to his time wave theory in math, in, in numbers, which he ended up taking very seriously because the numbers dissolve the mistakes that the language created. But in any case, this is all neither here nor there. We should, uh, we should focus on, on Aristotle and not Terence McKenna, because to do so is to presume that the latter has any relevance on the former, a mistake I self-consciously make all the time because it's more fun. Uh, so onward. So let's talk about Aristotle the biologist, because not only does Aristotle's biology play into all of this, uh, some, namely Lawrence Prinkopi, argue it's the very foundation of his entire cosmology. Prinkopi believes that if you want to unpack Aristotle in a much clearer way, you should go to the biological works first. Stuff like on the parts of animals or on the motion of animals, rather than the physics or the metaphysics first, which is where people tend to go. Whereas Plato thought of geometry when he thought of the forms, Aristotle thought of biology, of bodies, of frogs and insects. He wanted to know what it was that made all of these things tick. Forms aren't up there, says Aristotle. They're all around us in nature. So Aristotle spent decades in observation of the natural world in the Eastern Aegean Sea which is a truly rich ecosystem, especially around the 4th century BC. Uh, he spent most of his time dissecting plants and animals, cataloging minerals, and, and that kind of thing. Most interestingly, Aristotle's observations were often, though not always, quite excellent. For example, Aristotle describes in one of his works how octopi use one of their tentacles to mate. This sounds fanciful, but it's actually true. Uh, not only that, but this sort of fact wouldn't even be verified until the 19th century. Now, unfortunately for us, this book on dissections is lost, much like the band dissection. So generally we have to figure out what it was all about from reading other extant authors. The reason we've probably got nothing from this book left is because it was likely made up of a bunch of drawings and diagrams of all sorts of animals split open, and 
If you know anything about copying manuscripts, you'd know it's hard enough to copy text without making mistakes, let alone detailed drawings of biological organisms. So that explains why we don't have it. But in any case, what's important here is that Aristotle was a man of action. He desired to know, and he got up and then he did something about it without asking anyone's permission to do things differently. Aristotle is famously quoted saying, to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. We're human doings to Aristotle, not just human beings. The being cannot exist without the doing. So if you really want to know a thing or two about the world, about yourself, you've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to cast a wide net. Ultimately, the wide net Aristotle cast would be his greatest strength and his greatest weakness. Alright, so I think it's safe to say that Aristotle's philosophy as a whole was far less quote-unquote spiritual than Plato's philosophy. But that isn't to say uh, Aristotle, like many Christians, Jews, Muslims, and so forth, didn't find something attractive about Platonic philosophy. Of seeing the search for truth, uh, the search for wisdom and understanding, as a spiritual journey, a sort of ascent of the soul. For Aristotle, this journey was about finding our place in this world, not trying to escape it. Uh, the flesh is not evil, it just is. So, early Plato, being more radical in his spirituality, would ultimately have had a deep impact on the more Gnostic branches of Christianity, those with more obviously dualistic tendencies. Whereas Aristotelian thought, and subsequent later Platonic thought, would become more attractive to thinkers of mainstream Judeo-Christian religions, particularly in the monasteries of medieval Christendom and in the madrasas of the Islamic world. Yahweh said his creation was good, after all, but to the platonically tinged Gnostics of the Hellenized Eastern Mediterranean regions, this Yahweh figure would become but a calcification of man's ego, an emanation from the one who, in arrogance, could recognize no thing higher than himself. Now, there's an interesting theory going around, and I heard it from Dr. Philip Carey, that for the length of time that Aristotle was a student of Plato's, Aristotle was quite a vociferous critic of his master. And now, the theory goes that the latter third of Plato's dialogue, what I would call his more mystical dialogues, are actually reactions and responses to the criticisms he took from his student. What Aristotle may very well have done is cause Plato to rethink his pessimism over his dual conception of the world. Now, the main dialogue I'm talking about where he does this, of course, is the Timaeus, which I mentioned earlier in my bit on the School of Athens. In it, Plato writes a myth, as he so often does, and he envisions a divine craftsman he calls the Demiurge. Now, this Demiurge is not an unchanging form. He's a sort of divine entity slash creator god. Um, he shapes the world from a bunch of pre-existent matter, using the eternal forms as his blueprints for creation. Now, like I said, this is a myth, of course. It's not really clear how literally Plato assumed people would take this. But whatever Plato's intentions were, one thing is for sure. They didn't matter. Many, many people in the ancient world, whether craftsmen or philosophers, took this myth quite literally, and it's a grand irony in history that a man so opposed to poetry managed to do so much damage with his own poetry, 
or maybe it's just poetic justice, I don't, I don't know. Either way, when you work with a myth like this, you create a hypostasis. You're, you're breaking up the one great thing into many little things, whether along dualistic or trinitarian or duodecalistic lines or whatever. If, if you take a myth like this literally, this world becomes a prison. Your body becomes a prison. Manifestation itself is imprisonment for the soul. Now, the problem here, if we want to blame Plato, and I don't really think he's fully to blame, is that the Timaeus emphasizes the similarities between the visible world and the forms more than it emphasizes the differences. Plato was no self-flagellating desert father or cathar bonhomme parfait trying to lacerate his body into the other world. This sort of thing you can read into Plato, but the negative perception of a dual world isn't there to the degree that it would be expressed by a number of later Gnostic traditions like, say, Manichaeism. Pl Plato had it good. He, he ran a prestigious academy, he lived an aristocratic life of leisure, he doubtless loved the gymnasium, and was an active and well-integrated member of his society. For the later Plato, and for the Neoplatonists who follow in his footsteps, um, as you can see in Plotinus's criticisms against the Gnostics, the visible world of the senses was beautiful and an appropriate receptacle for the impressions of the forms. It was quote-unquote good enough. It was not just this place of cosmic loneliness, of alienation, of separation from the good, the beautiful and the true, we, we see something of a change of heart in later Plato from this initial Socratic view that the world is a shady place of imprisonment. Now, much later Christian and Jewish thinkers would adopt a variation of this story, rejecting pure Platonic and pure Aristotelian thought alike by positing that God created everything ex nihilo, out of nothing, and uh, Quote, it was good until Adam sinned and the world was cursed to death. Likewise, the forms were not thought to be above God, but rather an eternal part of the eternal mind of God. I don't want to talk about the medieval reception of the texts too much right now. We'll save that for another time. But I thought this might be an interesting detail. So, a point of detail that Aristotle and Plato really agreed on was this notion of a world soul. Um, and when I say world soul, I don't really mean some sort of uh, genius loci, like the guy in mind or anything like that, a, a local divinity. That sort of thing would be part of a greater integrated whole. No, the world soul for these guys was basically the thing which gives motion to every celestial body, to every person, to every animal, to every cell, and to every atom dancing in space. So it's for this reason that what Plato calls a world soul, Aristotle calls the prime mover, the first thing which set everything in motion. Now, what's weird here is that to Aristotle, the prime mover is outside of the universe. And this would be a very attractive notion to the Christian scholasticists. Whereas the world soul of Plato just permeated everything. You might expect it to have been the other way around, but it wasn't that way. Now, Aristotle didn't believe that this infamous prime mover pushed the universe into existence. Remember, to Aristotle and to most of the world at this time, the universe was conceived as geocentric, not flat, uh, with the globe of the Earth being enclosed by a number of concentric spheres. Sometimes eight, sometimes nine, sometimes ten, depends who you talk to. Uh, this is where expressions like seventh heaven and cloud nine originated from. Now, this motion was more like the product of an attraction than a push. 
As the outer spheres moved, this caused the inner spheres to move. Sort of like a gyroscope. Well, how did Aristotle think that this all started working? Well, the answer might startle you, uh, because he got it from Plato. Aristotle believed that the spheres were set in motion by love. By platonic love. The same sort of cosmic love which causes particular chemicals to bind with other chemicals to the exclusion of many others. To Aristotle, the outer spheres desired the first mover. They desired to return to their source. And so this desire manifested itself as motion back toward the Empyrean, back beyond the veil, back toward the boundless light of the prime mover, which of course it can never attain, thus producing this universe's seemingly endless and unchanging ouroborotic circular motions. Aristotle believed God to be a disembodied mind, a sort of eternal intellect in perpetual self-contemplation. It's not contemplating the material world, of course. It's contemplating the intellectual world, or for lack of words, it's itself. As Philip Carey says, to make it as close to the Greek as possible, it's intellect intelligizing itself. Nous noseos. Mind minding itself. Now, all this might make God seem like a distant, removed, abstract, and uninvolved God, but that's because we need to know how we all participate in this God, and in order to figure that out, we're going to have to get back to the subject of form. Well, how do we distinguish between, say, a man and a dog? Both of them are made up of the same material, of course, blood, guts, bones, and so forth. Well, obviously we can tell them apart by their difference in form. And again, to Aristotle, this form is not some distant intellectual realm. It's right in front of us. But here's the interesting thing. We know that this form, this, this form of man's body, is distinct from matter because it isn't the matter itself. Well now, it seems like we're getting closer to Plato again. But at what point did this happen? Aristotle tells us that there's some sort of light in which we perceive these forms, and this light, this divine spark, he calls active mind or active intellect. You can read about this in Book 3, Chapter 5 of De Anima, uh, On the Soul. Aristotle believed that when we contemplated forms, it worked differently than from the sense of sight. When we contemplate the form or image of man, for example, we become the form or image of man. Our noose temporarily takes the shape of the impression, the sum total impression. This is officially called the identity theory of intellectual knowledge. And it's a way that Aristotle reconciled his hylomorphism with his master's theory of forms. Now, let's extend this process that is the mind of man and extend it to the mind of God, which, if you remember, was busy off in some transcendental realm contemplating itself. And what that understanding looks like, then, in the field of God's consciousness, is the sum total of all the forms in the universe. To know a form is to be identical with it. So this great divine mind Aristotle posits is not only conceiving of itself, but also the whole of the sensible world. The difference between the mind of man and the mind of God, then, is that the mind of man does not contemplate eternally. Not only that, but the mind of man is not omniscient. Uh, 
we have to come to knowledge through discursive means, being drawn out of ignorance and into knowledge. The mind of God, though, operates quite differently. But let's not forget, and I must stress this, that we are still contemplating the forms within the divine mind. We're, we're sharing in the mind of God. And now we're getting into ancient Aristotelian exegesis here, because Aristotle really only wrote a page about all this Baroque stuff. But here's what Alexander of Aphrodisias thought, that we ourselves are contemplating the same forms that the divine mind is contemplating. So when we contemplate the form of a chair, let's say, to use a classical example, we're stripping away all the chairs we've ever encountered with our senses and consciousness is becoming identical with a sort of archetype of chairness. Well, that chairness in our mind's eye is actually a form in the mind of God. So what I'm saying is this, the act of contemplation itself, rather than the act of sensation, is the act of becoming identical with the divine mind. For as long as we hold on to those intelligible forms in our mind, we're one with them, and thus we're one with God. In that moment, that's where Aristotle believes we find happiness. Now, if you ask me, this notion is extremely profound, and it's for good reasons that it would have an extremely profound impact on many spiritual traditions who later inherited and expounded upon the works of Aristotle. Happiness, then, for Aristotle, was not a matter of riches or glory or political success or great artisanry or anything like that although all of those things were important to the proper functioning of a society. No, all these things were only good insofar as they allowed for the privilege of contemplation, which is the nature, remember the, the telos, the purpose of the mind to begin with. In this contemplation, in this in this yoga or, or union with the mind of God, we find true happiness. We find what the Christian calls the beatific vision, a, a blessed union with the mind of God. Now, all of these ideas would be of tremendous importance to not only the Christians, but also to the Neoplatonists. What separates a Platonist from a Neoplatonist is really just this. It's the collapse of the dualism which was rendered possible by Aristotle. Everyone was done making the good the enemy of the perfect, and so Aristotle largely led this powerful and history-altering charge. Nature was not empty of good. It tended toward the good. Good was in its nature. It's, uh, it's like Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So, in this sense, the Aristotelian theodicy made room for evil, made room for corruption, made room for decay and death and so on and so forth by saying that nature tends toward the good, not that it is outright good. Now, I think I'm going to wrap things up for today. I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I must admit, there's far, far more to say about Aristotle, especially in regards to the history of Hermeticism. Uh, Aristotle's thoughts will dominate the intellectual landscape until the coming of Galileo. So what I think I'll do, rather than just laying it all on at once, is just keep coming back to Aristotle and Plato as various figures throughout history begin discovering, unpacking, and interpreting their ideas. This will keep their ideas fresh in our minds throughout the course, as opposed to just seeming monolithic and static. I have an abundance of resources on the subject, I just need more time to convey them to you without crushing us all in the process. 
All right. So that being said, this has been Dan Attrell. Uh, you've been listening to Encyclopedia Hermetica, a big history. Please visit my website, themodernhermeticist.com, for more details. Thanks.